that's very important. It's wonderful to see such a big audience. I'm used to speaking to audiences in the lower single digits, as I, call, as I often refer to them. I had a, lect a professor at Glasgow University in the good old days, and he was a professor of humanity, now known as Latin. And he loved giving us back our unseens because they were so full of gaffes and so many mistakes. And he used to say to the students, candidates with marks in the lower single digits are reminded that these marks are purely complimentary. <laughs> so I picked up that ominous phrase, the lower single digits, from him. It's a delight to be with you today. I'm sorry that it's taken a year to get here. That's not due to Scott Rail. It's been due to surgery, which I required last year and which has been eminently successful. It's been the best stitch up of my career so far. I'm very pleased to be here and to talk about the birth of Highland evangelicalism. I'll be making various qualifications as I go along. Dougal Buchanan, 1716 to 68, the Gaelic New Testament, 1767, and the hymns of Isaac Watts. And I will also be talking a bit about the Puritan inheritance which Dougal Buchanan so supremely displays. Let me therefore begin today with a confession. It's a good place to make confession and I have a couple to make. It's an important confession. Although the principle has been very generous, I would like to say that I am not in any way qualified to speak on a subject as broad as that in the title of this address. Thank you for your trust in me, Principal, but I'm not really, as I say, a church historian. As you said, I am, or at least I was, an academic teacher and researcher in Celtic studies. That was my calling until I retired in 2008. Very happily, I may say, it was a great moment to be away from the institutions and back into my own natural operating environment, which was not a university, really. However, from time to time, and mainly in an attempt to close gaps, which nobody else at that time was attempting to close, nobody in the actual colleges or universities, I used to stray into history and theology, and particularly into Highland Church history. And these were fields which were, I often thought, far beyond the range of my competence. However, I was encouraged by people to do that, other scholars, particularly the late Professor David Wright, who, is, who was such a friend, I'm sure, to many of us here, and who used to guide me as my feet stumbled in these rather difficult bypaths of history. Highland Church history, I suppose, was a bit of a diversion from my own field, but yet it was also very much integral to it. The first Gaelic printed book appeared in 1567, just exactly 200 years before the Gaelic New Testament was published. It as a sign of the coming times, was a translation, a translation of John Knox's Book of Common Order, and it was translated in Argyll by Bishop John Carswell into a form of classical Gaelic, a very important document indeed. And so right at the beginning of the printed history of Scottish Gaelic is a religious text, Carswell's translation of the Book of Common Order, extremely important in terms of the language itself, the language he actually used as he translated, and also the course of the history of the church in the Highlands. I found it very interesting to go into these fields, not least because, being a disputatious character, I soon found a lot to disagree with. And I found that quite often the received doctrine which I was supposed to absorb and to take as gospel truth was not necessarily so at all. And 
I had to deal with difficulties in our understanding of early texts. Carswell was one, and I worked on him. But another was most assuredly the man who is at the centre of my lecture today, Dugald Buchanan. I first made his acquaintance as an academic subject in 1970 when I was at the University of Glasgow as an undergraduate in Celtic studies. One of my teachers set us an essay on Dugald Buchanan and another Gaelic poet, Alexander MacDonald, from the same century, the 18th century. And in preparation for my essay, I read Professor Donald, McLeod, Donald Maclean's edition of Buchanan, which was published in 1913. Professor Maclean's edition was then regarded as definitive, but I began to detect little challenges at the heart of the edition. I realised that somehow or other I was getting one Buchanan in the introduction and another in the notes at the back of the book. And I began to investigate this. My sort of, I suppose, detective nose began to twitch. And I went off down to the depths of Glasgow University Library. It's got great heights, but it's also got great depths. And I pulled out original texts by Buchanan and by Isaac Watts, and I began to compare the two. And I very soon realised that there was a story to be told. And I've been trying to investigate this for the best part of an academic lifetime. It's been a voyage of rediscovery which I have found very interesting because it has provided me not only with great insight into Gaelic literature from that period, but also into the development of what um, we call Highland Evangelicalism. So now my second confession, and this will be the end of the confessional, I think. I'm not really terribly comfortable with the single term Highland Evangelicalism. I don't think there was ever a single entity which could be defined in that way. I myself was brought up in a Baptist context in the island of Tyree, and not really a Presbyterian one, though we were very much um, friends with the Presbyterians as well. We were very ecumenical in the best sense. The term Highland Evangelicalism is to me a bit of a fraud, and those that know me well will know that I've published on Celtic Christianity. And sometimes, just sometimes, I think a companion volume on Highland Evangelicalism is called for. There was nothing particularly particularist or essentialist about Highland Evangelicalism. It didn't spring up independently in the Highlands, in Highland soil. It was the result of a gradual coming together of various theological understandings and ecclesiastical currents, many of them emanating from places far beyond the Highlands. These currents were transported across the Highland line in people's hearts and minds and pockets and then clad in a fresh linguistic garb, namely Gaelic. Of course, Gaelic imparted a distinctive quality to these ideas, as they were enculturated in the Highlands, but that does not mean that they were created in the Highlands. They took root there, and no doubt produced their own distinctive versions. I would also doubt if there was a single moment of birth, a grand entry of the phenomenon, which can be dated to a particular year. The timescale for the birth of Highland Evangelicalism is, in my view, gradual, with different ideas coming in at different times, different preachers coming in, and producing a hybrid package complete with local and denominational variations. As I said, I myself was brought up in a Baptist, Gaelic-speaking, Gaelic-preaching context in Tyree. And as for evangelicalism itself, we can debate its origins, characteristics, and even its meanings endlessly. In my view, it cannot be neatly defined by an all-embracing formula. It is, as I perceive it through my own studies, a coat of many colours, worn by many different Josephs across the centuries. These points are illustrated very clearly indeed in the life and work of Dugald Buchanan, 
who, as you know from the title, lived from 1716 to 1768. To do him justice, however, we have to set aside the older perceptions of editors like Donald MacLean, who tended to regard Buchanan as a freestanding gale, an original poet, and even a sublime one, who was largely untouched by non-Gallic influences. It was MacLean's rather uncomfortable attempt to minimise external influences that caused me to investigate Buchanan much more closely. And I may say that scholarship is a continuum. We are all reflecting on one another's views. We're all building on them. We're all setting them aside and we're all replacing them with newer versions, newer currents of thought. And I have no doubt that in my own time, in, in years to come, I too will be revised in like manner. That's how scholarship goes. It's provisional. So as a result of my own investigations, I realised that Buchanan was very obviously responding to and participating in a range of spiritual and literary force fields which are originated far beyond the Highlands, but which shaped what we call Highland evangelicalism. He interacted with these in different ways, but he has left a range of writings in English and Gaelic, which, has, which allow us to see the various factors which contributed to his own spiritual formation and to the wider Highland religious experience in the 18th century. And I need to stress that Buchanan was wonderfully fluent in both English and Gaelic. He could write superb Gaelic, but he could also write magnificently in English. Some of his letters have survived, and some of them were printed later as models of good English prose and also pastoral advice. He was a master of the English language as well as a master of Gaelic. Completely bilingual, completely comfortable in both languages. What's his background? Buchanan was born and brought up in a place called Ardoch, beside Strathair. Some of you will know Strathair, I'm sure. And if you go up through Strathair, you will see the community shop. How many of you know that? I'm sure you do. It's a kind of landmark as you go through Strathair. If you go over the bridge to the left as you're going through, and then turn right, you'll come to Ardoch. And up there, sitting on a hill, is Te Nishian. And believe it or not, that's the home in which Dougal Buchanan was born. It is still there. And those who are his relatives are still living in the house. I couldn't believe this. I thought, is this possible? I'd gone up to the door and I'd knocked in that innocent way which academics have. <laughs> and I said to the man, is this Dougal Buchanan's house? Oh, he said, yes, of course it is. Come in. And I'm related to Dougal Buchanan. And we had a chat about Dougal. But as close as that in terms of his home. And it should have a big blue plaque on it to say that Dougal Buchanan was born here. It ought to have that blue plaque. There's no other writer of the 18th century, no other Gallic poet known to me, to whose home you can actually go still. And it's much as was in Dougal's time. It's absolutely amazing. And the family who were so aware of the Dougal link, and they've reconstructed a wee model of the old mill where Dougal used to work with his father, who was the miller there in Strathire. It's really quite amazing in Ardoch Strathire. So have a wee look the next time you're up there. Buchanan, however, is best known as a, being a schoolmaster. He was a schoolmaster in the northern part of Perthshire, Kinloch Rannoch. He was sent there after the 45 rebellion, with which I'm sure you're all very familiar. It happened only yesterday, of course. And um, he was sent there to, I suppose, civilise the wild men of Rannoch. The forfeited estates had taken charge of the estate of Strowan, and there was a factor who was very sympathetic to Dougal Buchanan's teaching. He'd obviously had a bit of a track record as a teacher before then, and William Ramsay gave him his salary for the next seven years. 
and said that he was willing to support Dougal Buchanan in position in Rannoch. And Dougal went up there and he was based first of all at Bunranach, and then he moved into Kinloch Rannoch. He was there in the centre of the new town. It was a planned village, really, and he was given his own house. And if any of you have been through Kinloch Rannoch, you may well know Buchanan Place. Buchanan Place is there where Dougal's original cottage stood before it was knocked down in 1881. So if you go to Kinloch Rannoch and there in the shadow of Shechalium, you can go around some of the haunts that were very familiar to Dougal Buchanan when he taught there. He combined his roles as schoolmaster with various other things. He was obviously a first-class penman, and he had made a contribution to Gaelic translation, various contributions. He worked on the Gaelic New Testament, and he was here in Edinburgh between 1765 and 1767, looking after it as it went through the press. He was the man they sent. And he is associated, as it were, with the tail end of the Gaelic New Testament project, rather than with anything particularly central. But my view is that Buchanan was indeed very, very central to what was going on. And I'll have a look at that as we develop our theme. He's been defined, I suppose, as a hymn composer in the popular mind. And that is because when he was here in Edinburgh looking after the New Testament, the printers knocked off a printing of eight of his Gaelic hymns. And they appeared in 1767 as well. So you've got the Gaelic New Testament and you've got this little volume of Gaelic hymns. He took his opportunity when he was in Edinburgh. But I think also the actual printing of the hymns um, was more closely related to the New Testament than we've realised. And I think that that was the way that his co-workers thanked him for what he did in the translation of the Gaelic New Testament. When he was in Edinburgh, he preached here. He preached to the Relief Congregation. He helped to set the Gaelic Congregation in Edinburgh on its feet. And he seems to have had quite a close relationship with the Relief Church. It is also said that he conferred with none other than David Hume, the great philosopher and the sceptical thinker of the day. It is said that Hume and Buchanan met and that they both debated spiritual things. We have no, I, no firm evidence that he actually did this, but it does seem to me entirely possible. When we're dealing with Dougal Buchanan, we're not dealing with simply a schoolmaster at the back of the highland beyond. We are dealing with somebody who is one of the great intellectuals of his own day, but he is a schoolmaster. And such people have existed down through the years. Hume had a more exalted position, but two great brains came together when Hume and Buchanan spoke together, as I'm sure they must have done. I have no evidence for it, but it's entirely possible, because Buchanan was very much in the swim of the Scottish Enlightenment. <clears throat> and that's something that we need to bear in mind too with the birth of Highland Evangelicalism, if there was ever such a thing, and even Scottish Evangelicalism. The Scottish Enlightenment is important here. And they weren't all sceptics like David Hume. Not at all. He was the exception. They were people who were believers in very powerful positions. Now, when I began to research Dougal Buchanan, I asked somebody who was in Edinburgh to help me, Dr. Don William Stewart, Donald William Stewart. He was my sort of unofficial research assistant. And he had a nose for going into libraries and searching out manuscripts. And this particular morning, a letter came through the post. And inside it was a transcript of another letter which Dr. Stewart had found. 
This was a letter from the Reverend John McLaurin of the Ramshorn Church in Glasgow. John McLaurin was the brother of the very distinguished mathematician Malcolm McLaurin, who was a professor of mathematics at Aberdeen and he had also strong links with Edinburgh. They were both Gaelic-speaking men, both evangelicals. They'd been brought up in Kilmodon near Glendarool, and they were on the hunt for a good ministerial candidate to present to a church in mainland Argyll. Colin McLaurin had the leverage with the patron, and Colin, his, sorry, John, uh, Colin McLaurin had the leverage, and John, his brother, was doing the scouting in Glasgow to see what sort of talent there was for the vacant charge, and then they could recommend this one to the patron. So, McLaurin, John McLaurin, wrote in his letter to Colin as follows. In company where the conversation turned on the most eminent young men about our divinity hall now, I have heard one Mr. Buchanan, who was Irish, from Balquidder, commended as of that number. This made me take pains this day, both forenoon and afternoon, to meet with persons who could give me the best account of him. I did not find the person I wanted in the afternoon, but in the evening I returned a visit I was owing to the master of the college, whom I have heard speak of him formerly. And after speaking about the scarcity of probationers now, and the talk that was some time ago about licensing some of our best young men, he confirmed the accounts I had heard of Mr. Buchanan before as one of our best students and particularly as one well-skilled in the learned languages and its divinity. Meantime, I have heard oftener than once that he is reckoned what they call too monkish and retired. I recognise that persona. This passage amazed me. Here we had the first evidence that this man, Dougal Buchanan, was in Divinity College in Glasgow in effect at Glasgow University in 1740, and making a name for himself as one well-skilled in the learned languages and its divinity. Now just think of that. Sitting in Kinlochranach, Perthshire, teaching SSPCK students and so on, people could come to that school, was this genius who had wowed the big Enlightenment teachers of Glasgow. That's the quality you have here a truly remarkable man. But he didn't make it into the ministry. He didn't, I think, get past selection school, perhaps because he was too monkish and retired. I don't know. But we don't know what he did after that in the 1740s. He's, he may have gone back to Ardoch and Strathire. I don't know whether he was a dropout or a drop-in or whatever he was, but he, he went back to Ardagh. Perhaps he'd finished his course. I have no idea. I'm ready for more surprises because when you're working in a field like this, one of the things you must be prepared for is a surprise. Never let your mind run in the rails of the familiar and the known. Always be ready for the new thing. And that's what makes research so exciting. We may presume, of course, that his Glasgow years stood him in good stead. And that also explains why he was such a valuable man to send to look after the Gallic New Testament when it was going through the press in Edinburgh. You couldn't get better than a man who was trained in the learned languages and their divinity, could you? That's the man. And it's so interesting to see him operating in the, within the Enlightenment context. Here you have the McLaurins. No ministers more fully, you know, ministers and professors, no family more fully represents the spirit of the Scottish Enlightenment than the McLaurins. The one a great divine, John. The other a great mathematician, Colin. And here they're having a look at 
Dugo Buchanan. Dugo Buchanan also wrote his own autobiography. Fascinating, this. He wrote what might be termed a spiritual biography, and he, I don't think, really wanted it to be published, but it was published in 1836. It takes us down to 1750 in his own terms, about there, just before he went to Rannoch. He was handpicked, as I said, by William Ramsey to go to work for the forfeited estates in their school in Rannoch. And about that point, this spiritual autobiography ends. A fascinating document. He tells us in it that when he was about 12 years old, he went as a tutor to some of the families round about, the bigger, better families who needed a tutor. And these houses to which he went often had libraries, and bright boys could go behind the scenes and pull out a book and have a good look and learn a lot. They were almost students themselves as they were teaching the pupils in the big house. And Buchanan tells us that when he was in one of these houses, I met with a book called Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. The title page, he tells us, suited me very well, for I thought that was surely I. In reading this book, I found that its author had been a great sinner and yet obtained mercy. And when Dougal Buchanan came to write his own spiritual autobiography, he modelled it on Bunyan's Grace Abounding. And it's fascinating. The kind of picture he gives us of himself is not of the aspiring candidate for the ministry or to the brilliant young scholar. He was that. But it is to his own sinfulness and his sense of abasement. He takes the Puritan paradigm as his own. And he has all the struggles that we associate with the Puritan experience, as Owen Watkins calls it. He has an agonizing conversion. He's searching for assurance. It's not only coming up to the conversion moment, it's what happens after that, and he details that in great, I suppose, with great, I su great knowledge. It's almost as if he's a a spiritual doctor, a spiritual pathologist taking off the various layers of the experience. But he does also become almost a second Bunyan. You can see how he adopts some of what happened to Bunyan for himself. He has frightening dreams, for example. He narrowly escapes drowning. And if you look at Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, you'll find that that's pretty prominent. Both of these motifs, pretty prominent in what John Bunyan has to tell us in his book published in 1666. The strange thing is he has nothing to say about Glasgow. He doesn't let on that he's been at the university or at the college. That's not there at all. And I've tried to look between the lines of this book, you know, <coughs> open the lines to see if you can see a wee chink that might suggest that Dugald has been to university. But no, nothing. He keeps that one quiet. It's almost as if it doesn't fit the evolving paradigm. And I'm mystified by that. I'm not sure why he does that, what his main aim is in quietening that down. But presumably, it's because he has had a new experience and the old experience doesn't fit comfortably within it. So he keeps it quiet. Now, if you know anything about autobiographies, you know that they're highly selective. People do tend to remake themselves as they write autobiographies. And you always have to ask yourself, what persona wrote that book? Always when you read an autobiography. Don't just take it at face value. It is a literary work, and perhaps presenting you with an aspect of the writer, a persona that you haven't thought of before. 
you make selections. You keep out certain things, you put other things, you bring up what you think is important. Buchanan may have been doing just that. But what is so interesting is that Puritan influence was flowing strongly at this time into the Gallic world. In 1750, just about the time when Dougal Buchanan, Buchanan's spiritual autobiography comes to an end, a book, a Puritan book called Baxter's Call to the Unconverted, who knows about Richard Baxter, who knows his book Call to the Unconverted, it was translated into Gaelic by the Reverend Alexander MacFarlane, formerly Minister of Kilninver and later of Aracher. He was a native of Buchanan, Loch Lomond side, where there was plenty of Gaelic. Loch Lomond side in that area, where you've got Loch, the Loch Lomond National Park today, that was full of Gaelic at that time. And Alexander MacFarlane who was also a graduate of Glasgow and who was also mentioned in John McLaurin's letter to Colin, he had been translating and he was busy on that. And this book, Baxter's Richard Baxter of Kidderminster's Call to the Unconverted, was the first part of a veritable flood of Gallic translations of Puritan texts which were to appear over the next century and a half. The works of Henry Alline, and John Owen among them. And the great student of that, and the man who first alerted us to all of this and studied that kind of literature, was indeed Professor Donald MacLean of the Free Church College. Buchanan himself was also involved in this Puritan flow. He was asked to translate the Mother's Catechism for the SSPCK, and he did that in 1757. So he was a participant observer of what was going on. And when he wrote his autobiography, he did it in magnificent English, not Gaelic, in the mode of Bunyan. But one of the interesting things here is that although Professor Maclean was so schooled in the Puritans, he didn't twig, is that the right word? Not sure. He didn't realise that Buchanan was modelling himself on Bunyan. And he thought that Buchanan, Buchanan's autobiography, or spiritual diary, was, and I quote him verbatim, modelled on the confessions of Augustine, and wonderfully similar to that great masterpiece. Odd. I find it hard to understand why Donald Maclean, of all people, reached that conclusion as a much more obvious model lay much closer to hand. The tendency back then was to say, oh, this Gallic writing, it reminds me of Shakespeare, or it reminds me of Augustine, or it reminds me of some great, great person way back centuries ago, when in fact, it's, the influences are often much nearer home. And this is a fascinating one. This is the part of Dougal Buchanan which I haven't quite researched yet, and I'm looking forward immensely to get into grips with Buchanan, Buchanan's autobiography and comparing it with Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. Marvellous topic for research. And I will do that in detail. The actual edition, as I said, of this autobiography was published in 1836. Buchanan may never have wanted it to be published, but it was. The editor didn't own up to who he was, and I presume it was a he, no known editor. It was published by Balfour and Jack, Edinburgh. And it looks as if the editor, naughty editor, had a lot of information about Buchanan that we don't have today. He knew that he'd gone to an SSPCK school somewhere near Ardoch. He could name the schoolmaster. And he had other things to tell us as well, which research proves to be absolutely right. So there you are. We have these wonderful um, literary works by Dougal Buchanan, which we haven't yet fully explored, and I'm still in the process of doing that. Now, one of the things about these autobiographies is that they're spiritual autobiographies. They're not concerned with the everyday occurrences round about. The authors will, if it's 
appropriate tell you about something that has shaped their spiritual experience. And Dougal Buchanan does just that. He tells us how on one occasion he went to Cambus Lang. And you can all guess, those of you who know Scottish history, what might have taken him to Cambus Lang. It was the preaching of George Whitfield. And Buchanan was there, a Gaelic-speaking man listening to George Whitfield on his second visit to Scotland. This is what he says in his diary. At this time, I was hearing a great noise about the great work of God at Cambus Lang, in consequence of which I went there, and was greatly comforted to hear the people speaking of their experience to one another. On the Sabbath, there was a great multitude gathered together, such a sight I never saw before. Mr. Whitfield lectured from Matthew 14, and there was uncommon concern among the people. But although I heard great threatenings denounced against sinners of all descriptions, yet I was not in the least affected thereby, and saw that unless the Spirit of God wrought upon me, it was beyond the reach of any mortal to do it. So there you are. Make all the noise you like. Thunder hard from the pulpit. But the ultimate work of grace is done by God's Spirit. And that is what Buchanan was getting at here. But he also recognised the importance of preaching and going out with the message. He was perhaps what they call nowadays an evangelical Calvinist. Whatever Buchanan may have had, whatever scruples Buchanan may have had about Whitfield, it's certainly clear that Whitfield's influence moulded him too. Because when he was a schoolmaster in Rannoch, he went out preaching and evangelising and catechising. In fact, the numbers that attended his preaching on the forfeited estate of Strauen the numbers were so great that he had to write to the forfeited estates to see if they would give him money to repair a building so that they could meet together out of the bad weather and so that they wouldn't get into danger coming through the woods to listen to him. So what you see going into the highlands is something in the way of the model which is already there at Canvas Lang, and you see it moving in through the person of Dougal Buchanan. I'd love to have heard Dougal Buchanan preaching because it is said that he was a very powerful preacher indeed. We don't have his sermons. There were no tape recorders. There were no stenographers writing down Buchanan's sermons in Kinlochranach. But what we do have are his hymns. And two of his hymns at least give you a flavour of what his preaching might have been like. One of them is called The Skull. And in this hymn, this poem, I'm never quite sure whether it's a poem or a hymn or what it is. I think it's a sermon in verse. He imagines himself as finding someone's skull. And he reflects on who might have had this skull. Could it have been the minister? Could it have been the factor? Could it have been some great military chief? Some great general or other? Could it have been the, the kind of... Be most beautiful lady in the land? Who owned this skull? And he uses this as a way of getting through to the people that there is mortality and that they have to face the end and judgment. And he says to them, right, it's time for you lot to get a move on before the door closes and you're left outside. That's the sort of sermon in verse that Buchanan composed. And similarly, the winter. He has a poem on the winter in which he uses it as a symbol of old age. And he uses all sorts of homely metaphors and images. The picture of the winter, how it brings ice and snow, how it dams the rivers. And he applies that to the course of our developing I suppose, human bodies, how they slow down, how, like my own, they need repairs from some time to time, 
And he applies that very cleverly. And then he refers to the seasons and how there are certain times and seasons when it's important to do certain things. So he sets this in the natural environment of Ranach. And then he says to the people and to the old man that he's trying to get through to, he said, it's time for you to make your peace with God before the winter comes. That's his poem, Engangre, the winter. And you can tr just feel the pulse of the pre preacher there. But Buchanan was more than that. And one of the fascinating things that I've picked up with Buchanan very strongly is his enormous debt to Isaac Watts. He was deeply indebted to Watts. He loved the works of Watts, and he particularly enjoyed Watts's Horae Lyricae, published in 1706. Watts was really the most popular composer of hymns in the 18th century. George Whitfield published a hymn book in 1753, and over half of the hymns in Whitfield's hymn book are by Isaac Watts. But Buchanan particularly appreciated the thoughtful, clear philosophizing that was characteristic of Watts and Watts challenging those who appealed to reason as the way to find God. And Watts would challenge people along these particular lines, pointing out to them that reason could take you so far, but only so far. And Buchanan seems to have loved this kind of verse. He loved the style of what? So crisp, so clean, so clear. Not a word wasted. Watts was a real master of how to use language. And Buchanan loved this. And he began to translate Watts into Gaelic. And he took chunks of Watts and put a really good Gaelic dress on them. So much so that people didn't realize that Buchanan was a translator of Watts. They thought that all this was original Buchanan. And this was the problem that Professor Donald Maclean had. Suddenly there were these similarities to Watts. And you can see them in the CFs at the back of the book, compare. It's more than comparing. Our man Buchanan was translating hymns like, what is our God or what his name? nor men can learn, nor angels teach. He dwells concealed in radiant flame, where neither eyes nor thoughts can reach. And Buchanan turned that straight into crack. Crete dio no crete anum, chatuk na hang le sars and gwaur, hain solis jalroch folis duur, far na chruik sul, no smuain na chor. And you can trace this debt right through you can see him also indebted to other poets. Edward Young, Night Thoughts, Robert Blair's Grave, James Thompson's Poems of the Seasons. And he's obviously reading these, and he's absolutely loving them. And I'm recently, I've recently been thinking that he must have had a copy of Whitfield's hymn book because of his poem, Fulangus Mohanir, the Suffering of My, Sav uh, my Saviour, a beautiful hymn which is still sung in Gaelic. And when you look at Whitfield's um, hymn book, there are a whole number of hymns together, a section on the sufferings of Christ. And many of these th themes find their way into Buchanan's beautiful hymn on the sufferings of the Saviour. It's a hymn which has been sung right down the ages and as I, I remember well hearing it first sung by Mary Morrison from Lewis. Very well-known hymn, and Buchanan's hymns have gone on down the years. I've been working away at the hymns and also discovering new hymns that we didn't realize Dougal Buchanan had composed. And I'm dealing with that part of his legacy in my next book on Buchanan. There's a magnificent hymn in the MacLagan Manuscripts in Glasgow University's li Library. And it's 
like Addison's one on the creation, which you probably know, and the, the music of creation, he has presented us with that. Similarly, Buchanan does this, but in a most glorious way. And another thing which I recently discovered is that these MacLagan manuscripts, these texts by Buchanan, these specimens in there, five of his hymns, plus this beautiful new one, new to us, are actually written in Buchanan's own hand. So we can go right back to him on the manuscript evidence in Gaelic. It's truly remarkable. You see, nowadays we're much more aware of what we call intertextuality, how different authors used one another's work, put the material together and remade it as yet another poem or song or a piece of prose, and Buchanan was doing that. This isn't Puritan plagiarism. I used to th I, when I first saw this, I was shocked. I thought, what are you doing, Dugald, stealing all this stuff from Isaac Watts? Well, he's not doing that. He's interacting beautifully with the material of his own time, and thoroughly enjoying it, as we do when we pick up a book of poems or whatever. And he's fitting all this out for the Gallic world. Trying to provide, I think, some good reading material for those who are going to come into contact with the Gallic New Testament. Let's lead them on in the process of thinking about God. Let's give them a wee book of hymns. And is ever the teacher making you think, making you go beyond? He's an exemplary teacher, and I may say I've learned an immense amount about poetry and about translation from studying Dugald Buchanan. He, he's like Watts. He's almost a Gallic Watts. He's absolutely marvellous in his use of language. He influenced other composers of hymns. Many of you will have heard of Peter Grant. Peter Grant, the Baptist minister of Granton on Spey, began to compose hymns alongside Lachlan Mackintosh, the minister of that time at Granton, because Dougal Buchanan's little book had come into their hands, and they wanted to compose hymns as well. So you've got Peter Grant because of Dougal Buchanan. And so you see, there's the 19th century, and Dougal in the 18th is contributing to the configuration of Gallic spirituality in the 19th century. And now to conclude, my last section is on the Gallic New Testament. The Gallic New Testament translation project, as we can call it, began about 1755, when the Society in Scotland for Propagating Christian Knowledge, the SSPCK, thought that it would be important to translate the New Testament into Gaelic. Previously, the SSPCK had been pretty hostile to Gaelic, but by the mid-century they were changing their position. Until that time, those who preached in Gaelic would have had to use Gaelic translations by classical scholars in Ireland, and these were put together in a wee book by Robert Kirk as a single volume, often called Kirk's Bible. But it wasn't Scottish Gaelic, it was classical Gaelic. So the Gaels didn't have ready access to the scriptures in their own language. So the SSPCK decided to remedy this. Well, as happens with translations, things proceeded very, very slowly. They gave the work to the Reverend Alexander Macfarlane that I've mentioned already, who was the Puritan translator, but he seems to have had great difficulty. He had problems in his parish when he moved to Aracher, he had no manse, he had to start pretty well from scratch, and he didn't have much spare time for translation. And the project got a bit bogged down. By 1757, he was making very little headway, and indeed doing nothing. And then somebody wrote to the SSPCK, apparently off his own bat, and the officers of the SSPCK at the next meeting took note of what had come from this man. And this is what they said. Produced 
two letters from Dougal Buchanan, schoolmaster at Drumhassel, that's just beside Kinloch covering a translation in Erse, what they called Gaelic at that time, some of them, covering a translation in, we can say Gaelic, of the second epistle of Peter, and proposing that the same should be sent to Mr. MacFarlane to be revised by him, which might be a means of forwarding the translation of the New Testament, for expedient of which Mr. Buchanan proposes to pay a visit to Mr. MacFarlane, and if it was agreeable to the committee to stay with him for three or four months when his school is thinnest, in which time he might make great progress in the translation. Now there you have a picture of a very, very supportive man. Buchanan is going to help MacFarlane, and at a moment of difficulty he's going to make it possible to translate the Gaelic New Testament. So, the SSPCK um, said, OK, and if this proposal be agreed to by Mr MacFarlane, the committee resolved to employ Dougal Buchanan for that purpose, and in the meantime delayed giving any directions about the specimen now produced until Mr MacFarlane's answer came to hand. Mr MacFarlane's answer, as far as I'm aware, never came to hand. And the Society had to hand over the translation project to the Reverend James Stewart of Killin. Dougal Buchanan is then pretty well airbrushed out of the narrative. He doesn't appear again until he pops up in Edinburgh looking after the translation as it's going through the press. But what is very clear is that James Stewart translated that New Testament at great speed. He started in 1760 and he was finished in 1763. Fast. And I wonder who was helping him. I have a fair idea that it was Dougal Buchanan. And what happened to his second epistle of Peter? I'm quite sure it's part of the Gaelic New Testament that we know today. Dougal Buchanan was very self-effacing. And in those days, the the schoolmasters played second fiddle to the ministers. The ministers always got the best slice of the cake. And the schoolmasters, well, you know, they could get what was left. They weren't very important. And yet many of them did the donkey work in translating Puritan and other texts into Gaelic. They were the real movers in such projects. When Buchanan was here in Edinburgh, he was also thinking about other projects. And he was writing to the great luminaries of the Enlightenment at that time, including Sir James Clark of Penny Cook. He wanted to make a dictionary for the Gales based on the New Testament. And he wondered if he could get the support of James Clark. And he also had another plan, that he was going out to the islands to collect Gaelic verse so that he could get the best specimens of Gaelic available. So he wrote to Clark. A remarkable insight into Buchanan. He realised that you needed various other tools for the Gaelic language, and he wanted to provide these. The SSPCK was supportive up to a point, but they drew the line very hard on Dougal Buchanan at this point. And so he had to go to patrons like Clark. And this again is your ordinary back of the beyond schoolmaster in the Highlands. What a man. It's hard to sum him up. So much of what he did or wa and wanted to do it either influenced the shape of Highland, the Highlands in the years ahead, or actually laid seed for it. The dictionary, a dictionary project was d carried out by the Highland Society of Scotland. And it was completed by a well-known free church man, who may be in that picture, I don't know, the Reverend Dr. Macintosh Mackay in 1828. So that was fulfilled. And later on, of course, there were more anthologies of Gaelic songs and poems 
from the islands. But think about it. The publication of the Scottish Gaelic New Testament in 1767, overseen by Buchanan and doubtless enriched by his skill in biblical languages, was an exceptionally important milestone for Gaelic in the churches and in the secular world. It was followed by the translation of the Old Testament, completed in 1801 and revised substantially in 1807. From that achievement flowed the work of the Gaelic school societies, the publication of journals and books in Gaelic, and there were also new yardsticks for writing the language. But just think of how important the Gaelic Bible became for the work of the church in the highlands and islands of Scotland. Absolutely critical. And right at the heart of it all is Dougal Buchanan. Sadly, Dougal Buchanan died at Kinlochranach in 1768. He went home to look after his people when the New Testament had gone through the press and he contracted a fever. He was not spared to see the impact of his hymns or the stimulus of the Gaelic New Testament and the whole Gaelic Bible. If we look at Buchanan's work in the 18th century context, we can see a number of external influences that he had absorbed and which later became parts of what is often called, for better or worse, Highland evangelicalism. We can see how he reacted to Puritan writing imitated its style, and prefigured the importance of Puritan texts and theology in Gaelic. We can see how he responded to George Whitfield and in his own person became an evangelist and field preacher. We can appreciate too how he loved the hymns of Isaac Watts and thought that the Gaels should have their equivalent, and how he wanted to stimulate minds on the basis of the translation of the New Testament. Dougal Buchanan then, to conclude, was a hugely important figure in the 18th century for all the reasons I've mentioned. If you want to understand the factors that went into the making of Gaelic-based evangelicalism in the Scottish Highlands after 1700, there is no better guide than the life and work of the brilliant but hitherto unacknowledged as such polymath. Dougal Buchanan, who interacted with and contributed to the various strands which seem to us today to be distinctive of our Highland spiritual heritage. Thank you.